probation and parole, a population nearly the size of our capital city of Trenton, a right that New Jersey denied since 1844. And finally, reparation. The idea that we have to repair the harm that flows from structural racism. Ours is a foundation in New Jersey and in America that is cracked by structural racism. And it's through those cracks that black communities in particular are experiencing real earthquakes. You see this most acutely right now in the coronavirus pandemic. Registration, restoration, and reparation. That's the theme of tonight. And we are made most powerful when we exercise our rights in each of those areas. The last thing I'll say before turning it back to Andrea is that we are now in the throes of the census. And there's been lots of confusion around how we get counted. We now know that we have until October the 5th. I urge you, you'll see in the chat the link to make sure that you and everyone you know are counted in the 2020 census. So much of what we live with, the structures that we live in, the resources we get or don't get hinge on our being counted in the census. It happens once every 10 years. It's happening now at least through October 5th. So don't leave this conversation without making sure you're counted and everyone you know are counted. Thank you for joining us tonight for our conversation about registration, restoration, and reparation. Thank you, Ryan, for those powerful opening remarks. I'll now turn it over to Institute Democracy and Justice Director Henel Patel for the registration portion of the evening. Henel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And it's an honor to be here with the, um, these few, uh, to, with the panel of panelists today. And I'm honored to work with them every day. Uh, so, you know, we are getting closer and closer to this election and we get a lot of questions and it is a time right now where we're hearing so much misinformation and so much, um, um, so much um, messaging to doubt our system. And one, I want to start with saying, you need to double down on democracy. We need to commit to it. We need to believe in it. But two, there's actually a reason why this is happening. From the very beginning, you know, we are ostensibly the oldest existing democracy in the world, except from the very beginning, we haven't quite lived up to that. We have never actually um, been a true democracy that lets everyone vote because that's what a democracy is, right? The idea that all of us have a vote, have a say in our government, but it's never really been the case because every single expansion of the vote of the vote in this country has been through major fights. I mean, wars, battles, the civil rights movements, it is people have shed blood to get uh, to make sure people um, that more and more people have the right to vote to make sure black people have the right to vote, make sure women have the right to vote, which has only been for 100 years, black people were after the 50 a civil war 15th amendment, and it still took over a um, 100 years, and um, the Voting Rights Act to make that a reality. And then yet we hit um, a time of mass incarceration where our laws that restrict voting rights um, with for people with criminal convictions um, denied more and more people. Your vote matters. If it didn't matter, there wouldn't be so much of, um, of uh, so much of a movement to deny so many people the right to vote. It matters. Um, and so today, please take this seriously, take your vote seriously and um, and use it. It is your power, our power in this government. So how do you do that? First, make sure you're registered. Register now. There is online voter registration in New Jersey. I will share a link in a minute. Um, or, and also make sure your registration is updated. If you are, do not live where you, uh, where, you tip, uh, where you are right now, where you, if you are registered somewhere else, maybe you have to move, maybe you're sheltering somewhere else because of COVID. Maybe you're in college and you're usually registered on campus and right now you're um, somewhere else. Make sure you update your registration so your ballot will come to you. Then know how to vote. It is incredibly important to have this knowledge, to always, always use um, how you vote, um, to know, um, to have the information so that you cast your ballot and that your ballot counts. So how do you do that? Um, we have this year, it's a different type of election than we're usually used to, and I'm going to walk you through it. There are five ways to vote this year. It is a paper ballot election. First, you are gonna get a ballot in your mail if you are an active registered voter. You can check that online. You can also find this little graphic conveniently at njisha.org forward slash vote our site. Check it out. We have a lot of information. First off, you will get that ballot in the mail. What do you do? 
you could, um, you have to make a voting plan. You could first put it in a USPS box, vote by mail as tradition, um, like traditional voting. You could do that. If you are going to do that, do that as early as possible. Make sure there is enough time to get that ballot there so it's counted. Two, you can use a secure Dropbox. You do not have to rely on USPS because there have been mail delays. Secure Dropboxes, they're like large mailboxes, but they're secure, 24 seven accessible, and they have video surveillance. The county controls them and picks up the ballots every day. It's cutting out USPS from the system. They're all over the place. There's more now than there were in the primary. You can find a list. You can check our website. You can check vote.nj.gov. They have, um, that is the state's website. You can find it there. Third, you can go to your county board of elections and drop it off there. Fourth, you can go to your polling place on election day and drop off your ballot. That's important because every municipality in the state of New Jersey has at least one polling place open and you can use that to drop off your ballot to an election official. Or fifth, you can vote in person by paper provisional ballot. Yes, those ballots count. They verify them. They make sure you're registered. They make sure that there, um, there aren't duplicates with vote by mail, but they count them. Those ballots do count. You can trust that. So if you need to vote in person and want to, maybe you need some help. Maybe you have some questions. Maybe um, you, um, you know it gets later and you don't have, you didn't get your ballot in the mail. You can go vote in person. If you are wondering, ballots have started, have begun sending, um, been sent out. Um, they've started. They have until the fifth. All the counties. Some people have them already. You, you'll get them soon. If you don't get them by mid-October, call. If you mess up, you can always get a replacement ballot, but always make sure it happens. And also make sure you sign carefully. We sued the state to make sure that there was a process so ballots weren't rejected because of signature issues. We have a system. There is a system here to make sure your, um, your ballots count, that um, you can trust our um, democracy and you should use it. This comes back to what it means to have a democracy, what it means to participate in it. You should vote. It's important. It is your biggest power. It is your main power in this country. But there's other ways. You can you can participate. You can protest, as so many people have been doing. You can do advocacy. You can help. You can commit to um, helping uh, ensure that we are expanding democracy. As Ryan said, we are, you know, we've been uh, automatic voter registration, online voter registration. We're still trying to get same day registration. We shouldn't have a 21 day deadline because the registration deadline is October 13th for November. So do it now. Um, but we shouldn't need that. Lots of states don't have it. You can also make sure that the people who can, uh, who should be able to have the vote, who we've been denying, long denying the right to vote, actually have it. And that's where it comes in. We had our 1844 No More campaign, which we launched, we've been running, has been the campaign to restore voting rights to people with criminal convictions, because this is the case. We have, for from 1844 onward, we have been uh, denying people the right to vote, denying them a voice in our government, despite being ostensibly a democracy. This is after 100 and over 175 years this year, people on parole and probation have the right to vote again. And these things are important, right? Because New Jersey has one of the highest black to white racial disparity and in incarceration rates in the country. That means that who we're denying the right to vote is dis uh, disproportionately black people. That is the reality of where we are in New Jersey. So this year, 83,000 people now have the right to vote for the first time. And that I'm gonna turn it over to Ron and Cass, who, who um, as Andrea mentioned, are advocates who are working to ensure um, to help people and have the right to vote again for the first time um, this year. Um, you'll hear about them and hear about why it matters, why your vote matters. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ron first. Ron, my friend, my colleague, and basically the beating heart of the campaign to restore voting rights here in New Jersey. Hi all, my name is Ron Pierce. I work for the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. However, I've also been known as New Jersey State Prisoner 210675. I am here today to talk about the importance of voting rights. My father taught me that voting was not only our most fundamental right, it was our duty to our family and our community. That voting had value to the soul, it brought a connectedness to it. So after I was convicted, I received a letter stating I could no longer vote. It disconnected me from my community and disconnected me from my family. But I really didn't fully grasp it until much later in 2013 while at East Jersey State Prison when I was at a New Jersey step uh, college class called Political Science, where we focused on the historical voting disenfranchisement of black people in America. At first I could hear the same things I used to hear all the time. 
My vote doesn't matter, and the system is rigged. But as we discuss how black bodies brought political power for their enslavers through being counted as three-fifths a person in the census, not given a voice, it became clear the vote for the enslaver grew more powerful because representation is determined by the census. Then we move to reconstruction and the newly freed slave, enslaved black men would gain the vote and start to actually get elected positions. But it was short lived, reconstruction ended and soon a variety of ways to suppress the vote brought back white supremacist ideology. These methods went from poll taxes to lynchings and other terrorist tactics to shut the voices of the black communities down. This lasted until the 60s when John Lewis and the freedom fighters left Selma to walk to Birmingham across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday. This led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. For a period, black communities began to have a voice after so many generations without. Then came the law and order movement and that led to the militarizing of the police and mass incarceration. An amazing thing happened during this class. Men started going from my vote doesn't matter to wow, how can I help my children in, this, in their class get this class if I can't vote for the school board? How can I help my community get better policing if I can't vote for the mayor who, by the way, appoints the chief of police? I started to hear my father's voice in that class. I saw a real transformation as these men seen if, it, if they were able to vote. And with that connection did, I saw the idea of voting as the spark of hope that ignited the fire of transformation. My life direction has been transformed by that class. Thank you. Uh, I, will, uh, I guess uh, it would be Cass's turn next. Yes, thank you. Greetings from Newark, New Jersey. My name is Cass Severe. Thank you for this opportunity. I am pleased to be here with you today. It's gonna to share my experience of having my vote taken away from me and then getting it back. Due to childhood trauma, I made some bad decisions in my life that made me incarcerated for periods of time. During those times, I lost the right to vote. I understood having to do the time for my mistakes, but I never realized until I tried to vote later on when I was on probation that my right to vote, essentially my voice, had been taken away from me. It hurt like hell to be told I couldn't vote. I felt like I didn't matter, like I wasn't part of society, like I wasn't no longer part of my community and I had no say over it. Just imagine someone telling you that you can't vote, how that would feel. As a result of the 1844 No More campaign, led by amazing people like Ron and the Institute, I had my vote restored over a year ago. I once again feel proud, like I belong, like I can contribute my essential voice to policies made that affect my community. Um, having lost my vote has really brought home how much my vote means and what impact it can have. When I cast my vote for November, I will know that I'm having a say in the resources provided to my community, resources like access to employment, adequate housing, to mental health care, to better public safety policies, to education and to rehabilitation. In fact, if these resources had been more adequate in years past, perhaps I would have made different decisions. So now I get to vote for people I think will help others in my community have access to what they need. I have to, I get to have to, I get to have a say in the policies that will directly affect my own family. I get to matter. This experience has been so transformative for me that I now spend time helping to organize voter registration drives throughout the city of Newark with the particular focus on the population re-entering society 
after being incarcerated. This has become a life mission for me. And if I leave everyone with one thought today, it's don't take your right to vote for granted. Appreciate it. Your vo vote is your voice. Tell others how important it is. Honor it by exercising it. Claim your voice as I will be doing in November and from now on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron and Cass, for those powerful remarks on the importance of restoration in this moment. I'll now turn it back to Ryan to turn us to the reparations portion of the evening. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Cass, and thank you, Ron, for those powerful stories. When, when Cass was speaking, I, I thought about how her being denied the right to vote because of a criminal conviction was a practice that New Jersey first employed in 1844. That was the year that New Jersey restricted voting to white men only. A couple of years ago, to Cass's point, we launched a campaign, a statewide campaign, that we centered Cass and Ron and other folks who could not vote in that campaign to build in 1844 no more and let people with criminal convictions vote. And part of what drove this advocacy was the recognition that in New Jersey, we have the worst black to white adult and youth racial incarceration disparity rates. So that in New Jersey, a black child is 21 times more likely to be in prison than a white child and a black adult is 12 times more likely to be in prison than a white adult. And because in New Jersey, we connect voting to the criminal justice system, we literally transfer those racial disparities from the criminal justice system into the political process where those racial disparities are lived out in our democracy. And so this campaign was really designed to restore power to people who should have access to the franchise. And so for me, it's especially gratifying to see that they will now have the right to vote in one of the most important elections in our time, of our time. Because voting is all about power. And power is organized from the ground up in our communities. And so please, the theme for tonight is make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure everyone you know is registered to vote. To Hennel's plan, point, make sure you have a plan. Don't wait until election day. Mark that plan now. Tonight's theme is also about restoration of voting rights, giving back to folks a thing they should have never lost. There's still 19,000 people in prison in New Jersey who should have access to the right to vote as folks do in Maine and Vermont and now in Washington, DC. But the third part of tonight is about reparation. That is repairing the harm that flows from structural racism. New Jersey is really a tale of two cities. It's like Dr. King talked about, there are two New Jersey's, two Americas in, in New Jersey. New Jersey, one of the wealthiest states in the country. It also has this wealth that exists alongside a really punishing poverty. New Jersey, one of the most racially diverse states in the country, is also one of the most segregated states in the country. New Jersey, a state where at this very moment we're talking about here and nationwide, the undeniable idea that Black Lives Matter is a truth being contested right here in New Jersey where black people confront some of the worst racial disparities in the country. So the conversation isn't complete. We've talked about rest, registration and restoration without also talking about how you repair harm from folks denied the right to vote because of criminal convictions. How you repair harm that emanates from a racial wealth gap that itself was birthed in slavery in New Jersey. And so I wanna lift up for you all that we stood with some courageous legislators a year ago to introduce legislation like that legislation championed by Senator Booker, who will join us shortly on the federal level to create in New Jersey a reparative justice task force. This is a task force that will one, look at New Jersey's role in slavery. You should know that slavery took root very, very deeply in New Jersey. The racial disparity that I talk about that exists today flowed directly from slavery. So this task force will one, Look at New Jersey's role in slavery Two, It'll make policy and other recommendations about how to address slavery and its enduring effects, its enduring consequences. That bill was introduced in November of last year and again in January. And I will say this to you, it hasn't moved. It hasn't moved. 
that folks aren't even willing to have the conversation and they won't unless you make them do it. Yesterday, California signed an almost identical bill that New Jersey today is sitting on. New Jersey two weeks ago passed a bill that creates a holiday on Juneteenth. And folks know that Juneteenth was a day when General Gordon Granger rode horseback into Galveston, Texas. He told uh, some black folks that they had been that they had been freed two years earlier. They just didn't know. So Juneteenth is a celebration of actual freedom. But we can't really celebrate Juneteenth here in New Jersey if we don't deal with the original sin of slavery and its enduring effects. And so we will drop a uh, link to a tool you can use to urge your legislators to pass this legislation and for Governor Murphy to sign it. Because our battle is at once here in New Jersey to hold our elected officials accountable, even as we fight a battle at the national level. We hold those two things in our hands at the same time, that we register, that we restore voting rights, and we repair harm from structural racism. Thanks for joining us tonight. And back to you, Andrea. Thank you, Ryan. So as we're waiting um, for Senator Booker to join, I actually just wanted to ask you a question on that, Ryan. Um, why in this moment we see millions turning to the streets across the nation, we understand that this isn't just a response to police brutality, it's a response to the cracks of structural racism that have existed for centuries. Why do you think that now is the moment that New Jersey needs to ask, needs to act more than ever to move forth this reparations task force? You elaborate on it a bit, but I just want like, why is now the moment that we really need to seize upon this in your view? So I think that people have appropriately thought about this moment as sort of an awakening, right? To your point, Andrea, you know, when Dr. King was assassinated more than 50 years ago, there were protests in hundreds of cities across the country. When George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota, that led to protests in thousands of cities, of thousands of cities across the country. Millions of people have taken to the streets to protest, yes, police violence against black people, but that is really a part of a broader protest to get at the structural racism that results in the kinds of things we're seeing play out. And we can have a different moment in this country. We can't move past what is often a harm reduction strategy to one that talks about how, how do black people in this country, how do we win? Or how do we go from having a conversation that says police, law enforcement, Stop harming us, stop harming our lives, stop taking our lives to one that says, when we get to live, how do we flourish? See, we can't move to that space until we do the harder work of getting to the underlying systems that drive what we see play out in our television screens and in our cities and in our streets. And so I think this is the moment to do big things. There's incredible harm we see being visited upon us. And so the response has to meet the harm. And the response that meets the harm is when we get to understanding the root causes of the harm and repairing it. The danger right now, Andrea, in this moment is that there's gonna be a lot of efforts to, to do symbolic things, right? I don't mean to diminish that Juneteenth is now a holiday in New Jersey. When I was in high school in Denver, Colorado, I was Mr. Juneteenth. We had a Juneteenth celebration. I was Mr. Juneteenth one year, big deal, right? And I, and I mean that, I enjoy being Mr. Juneteenth, but I also know that we have to get to the underlying systems that the symbols reflect. So a Juneteenth holiday without getting to what Juneteenth is all about is actually not that meaningful of a symbol. I would have rather seen us pass a Juneteenth holiday after we did the harder work of understanding the root causes of the racial disparities and the enduring effects. And so now I say this to you, this is something that we've learned over time. We learned when uh, Dr. King went to President Johnson and asked for a Voting Rights Act, he said, make me do it. Then came the Bloody Sunday March from Selma to Montgomery. We saw more recently when advocates, including uh, me and others, went to President Barack Obama and asked for things. And he said, if that's what you want, you gotta make me do it. That is also true right now, that even the most progressive-minded politicians 
will sound in progressive ideas, but they only really move when we make them do it. And that's the moment that we're in both here in New Jersey and at the federal level. And I see that our very first lawyer and now United States Senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker has joined the line. So I'll kick it back to you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's now my pleasure to introduce US Senator Cory Booker who will expand upon the conversation we're having about connecting this idea of reparative justice to the power of the vote. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. I, I'm really grateful to be here and just, just wanna say how much my team relies on the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice. Um, it is extraordinary, this organization uh, and the contributions you're making to our state and frankly, uh, to the nation. And I wanna thank my brother, Ryan, when he said that I was the first lawyer, I, I, I'm not that old, man, and you don't have to insult me like that. But beyond that, Ryan, uh, uh, just so much love for him and so much gratitude uh, for his whole family, which is extraordinary. And over the past few months, uh, people all over New Jersey and this country are really experiencing a lot of hardship. And we've seen the stories coming out of our state. Uh, New Jerseyans are losing employment, uh, experiencing large scale, uh, uh, racial reckoning and a staggering economy. So much is combining into this moment uh, to make it difficult. But I really do pray and, and believe that in many ways we're expanding our circles of empathy and more people are beginning to come to the understanding of how we have such extraordinary systemic uh, racism in our country against black and brown people. And that there is an urgent need to fix this system and to bring about uh, restorative justice. Uh, we know that we have an administration, administration right now uh, that refuses to even uh, acknowledge it. Uh, I talked to the Judiciary Committee today about how Donald Trump was moving to end uh, racial bias uh, and sensitivity training in the federal government, calling it anti-American. And so he's not only someone who doesn't acknowledge the urgency of dealing with systemic racism, he actually calls efforts to address it uh, uh, anti-democratic, anti-American. And so we have a lot of work to do in a number of areas. And I wanna first take a moment to just to talk about voting rights. Voting is one of the most fundamental rights that we can exercise to affect meaningful change. Uh, and the power in voting is self-evident. Uh, and so many of our opponents uh, right now, opponents of the ideals of the free access to voting are working extraordinarily hard uh, to undermine this basic right, uh, this right that was fought for and bled for and even died for by our ancestors. And one of the big issues for me now is after the gutting of the uh, Voting Rights Act is to understand that this has to be part of the center of what we do in order to achieve larger goals and larger aims of restorative justice. As we speak right now, uh, there is a tremendous amount of work going on. I talked to one of the lawyers that works alongside uh, many of the senators on the cases that they're bringing all over this country to try to thwart efforts to restrict access to the polls of black and brown people, of college students, uh, of indigenous people. And so we have a real work to do. Um, we have to make sure uh, that this is a, a, a pivotal part of the larger agenda because when you have free access to the franchise and when you have high voter turnout amongst people of color, their interests are represented. Uh, I introduced recently the Democracy Core Acts to expand access to the ballot um, as COVID-19 imposes new barriers on uh, the right and access people have to voting. Uh, I want to make sure that I am part of that effort and movement in Congress to get more people to vote. Uh, we have to start looking at uh, uh, using our electoral power um, then to start really at attacking issues of uh, restorative justice. Uh, I'm proud to sponsor in the Senate, for example, the reparations bill or, or House Bill HR 40, um, which is to establish a commission to study the impact of slavery and continuing discrimination against African-Americans as we make recommendations, as, a, as the uh, panel will make recommendations uh, on reparations to descendants of slaves. Um, when we talk about 
issues of uh, marijuana. I talk about issues of restorative justice. And it's one of the reasons why the Marijuana Justice Act, a version of which has been picked up in the House of Representatives, talks not just about legalizing marijuana, but trying to balance the scales of past harms, reinvesting in communities that were disproportionately targeted uh, by the war on drugs. Another restorative justice effort I'm doing is one around baby bonds, which is this idea that we have to address the racial wealth gap. And one of the ways to do that is by having every child in America get an account uh, when they're born uh, and then based upon the income of their parents, they get deposits in that account upwards of $2,000. The reason why I see that as a tool of restorative justice is because African-American families have about one-tenth the wealth of white families, and therefore, um, they will be disproportionately beneficiaries of such a program. Uh, there is a lot of work we have to do. And for me, this is one of those moments, as I look past this election, where if we are able to get a, a, a unfettered access to the franchise, and I know that's a big if, we could actually be in a position uh, to begin to push legislation uh, um, and, and real change at the federal level that will not just try to uh, uh, make more justice now, but try to address past injustices as well. Injustices that we see everywhere uh, uh, and systematic racism everywhere from our healthcare system all the way uh, uh, to uh, education and educational opportunities in our country. There is an urgency, but there's also a hope. Uh, I'm hopeful because I'm having conversations with my Senate colleagues that I've never uh, been able to have uh, with, their, with deeper understandings, especially after the horrible murder uh, of, uh, of George Floyd, the death and murder of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. It seems to be that the very soil of our souls have been tilled up and there's more of a receptivity to planting seeds of understanding that can great, grow great harvests. And so I see this amongst legislators now willing to consider bills, legislations, and efforts on the federal level. But I also know that as Frederick Douglass says, power concedes nothing without a demand. We need to continue to have an American public that is more activist in its commitment to fighting for restorative justice in our country and fighting for opportunity. And so I, I, with 30 plus days to go, I just want to emphasize the urgency in voting. And, and I'm going to have to say this, forgive the commercial, but the urgency uh, to fill out your census forms. Uh, these are two things that are fundamental to the larger fights that we have uh, to making this nation live up to its promise of being a place with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we have work to do, but it starts with the processes that have already begun in the state of New Jersey. Uh, uh, for the voting process, which has already started. It starts with our participation, our activism, our engagement, and hopefully uh, through that political power, uh, we can actually change, um, change policy and make us a nation uh, that is more just uh, and has addressed uh, uh, so much of the past harm uh, and the past damage that is done uh, through years past, uh, through the unju in unjust injustice in years past. And so with that, thank you very much. Uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be with you all in community, uh, even though Ryan started off with such an insult to my, to my spirit. Thank you so much, Senator, for those important comments and for again, uplifting the census. Um, just wanna reiterate everyone, please, please, please fill out the census. We've included a few links to it in the chat. And we also thank you for your leadership on reparations at the federal level, as well as the baby bonds program, which we at the Institute have advocated for at the state level um, and are excited to hopefully have that move forward in the forthcoming future. I'll now kick it to Reverend Charles Boyer to elaborate upon the moral imperative of viewing voting through a reparative frame. Reverend Boyer. Yep. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you to everyone in the Institute. And so I'm just going to take a minute from a, from a preacher's lens to think about this whole reparations piece and tie it into uh, voting. So scripture, right? I'm a preacher. Uh, Exodus 11, 1 and 2 says, the Lord said to Moses, uh, I'll bring one more plague upon Pharaoh in Egypt. Afterwards, he'll let you out. Tell the people that every man is to ask his neighbor and every woman is to ask her neighbor for objects of silver and gold. You drop down to 12, 35, and 36, 
says the Israelites did as Moses told them. They asked the Egyptians for jewelry of silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. That's reparations in scripture for slavery. New Jersey was the last state in the, in the union to let slaves go. The ports in Camden were amongst the most major ports in the slave trade. And when you look at the gradual emancipation that New Jersey had, which really set the precedent for youth incarceration because they kept folks generationally in servitude even beyond. It explains why we have some of the worst prison issues, particularly in the youth uh, area in New Jersey. It explains the economic devastation and disparities and the massive racial wealth gap. And so the word, even the word reparations is scary to many New Jersey electeds because reparations is all about a debt so great that it would actually quantify and fully define the depth of harm that this state and the nation has done and continues to do to black people. Right here in New Jersey, right, is, has some of the most racist constituency in the United States. You know, we pretend to be progressive on the national scale, but the reality is, is that many of the areas in New Jersey are amongst the most racist and the electeds have to pander to racists. They're really no different than what we see in the debate the other night. There's a pandering to racists in order to stay elected. Uh, why do I say just in February? This did not get a lot of uh, attention because we got hit with the coronavirus. But in February, Homeland Security, just before COVID, said white supremacist extremism in New Jersey was the state's greatest terrorism threat. And so when you look at all of this, the massive depth of racism and bigotry and pure sinfulness that New Jersey has amongst this constituency, it gives us no choice but to determine and to understand that the math leads us to the conclusion that those electeds represent exactly the constituency. And so it becomes very hard to move anything that is racially just in New Jersey. That's why we can change some names. So we can change the word from slavery to servitude, but it is still slavery. And so whether it's the drug war, whether how we're about to legalize marijuana and you have senators that are blocking everything possible to do anything reparative about it, whether it's redlining and home ownership, whether it's racial disparities, the worst in the nation and the prisons and the youth prisons, whether it's the apartheid school and how home rule plays into all of that, the unjust policing and changing town names and having 500 and something different municipalities so I don't have to live next to a black person whether it's unequal pay, the state, the corporations, you name it, you go down the line, they all owe a debt because they only become prosperous on the backs of black people. And so if your elected official is not down with reparations, if they are afraid of it, it is because they don't value you. And so if your elected does not value you, they don't value your vote, and you need to vote them out. Thank you very much for the opportunity, y'all. Thank you, Reverend Boyer. I think the mic was just dropped when you uh, completed your statements there, but thank you so much for the powerful remarks. So I know we have about 15 minutes left to take some audience questions. So I wanna throw some questions to the panel. There was a question which I think Ron and Reverend Boyer would be in position to answer. Someone asked about the status of S2519 the public health emergency credits bill, um, whichever one of you would like to answer about the status. And first by starting for those people who are unfamiliar with it, talk about what it is um, before leading to the status. So I'll kick it to Ron or Reverend Boyer, whoever wants to take that one. Sure, Ron, you wanna take it first? Uh, well, go ahead, go ahead, Reverend Boyer. You, you can answer that one. Okay. So uh, the prison credit bill, uh, we 
we got through both houses uh, after much, much fighting, after much energy, uh, but it is through both houses. It is on the governor's desk. And so once the governor sign it, we will have one of the uh, most massive uh, exodus from New Jersey prison that from prisons that any uh, state has seen in the nation. We would have set the precedent uh, for how to decarcerate uh, during a pandemic. And so it's all in the governor's hands. And so we're looking forward to uh, Governor Murphy signing that legislation any minute now, any minute now, any minute now. That's the status. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question, this is just a kind of logistics question. How do people get their right to vote restored? What do they have to do? I'll throw that to Ron Hennel, Cass, whoever wants to answer that. Uh, yeah, I, I can ask, answer that one. Uh, the, the reality is all they have to do, anyone that is not currently incarcerated for an indictable offense that's in other states is called a felony, but in New Jersey, we only call it an indictable offense, has a right to vote. They only need to register. That's all they need to do. And then of course, actually go and vote. But whether they're on parole, probation, even if they're in a county jail for a non-indictable offense, which is a misdemeanor, awaiting trial or other reasons other than sentenced for an indictable offense, they have a right to vote. Uh, that, that is all they have to do. Everybody in this state has a right to vote if you're not currently incarcerated for an indictable offense. Thank you. And there was a related question about if once Governor Murphy signs the public health pandemic credit bill, um, when the people are released from the facilities, will they automatically have their right to vote restored? Yes, and no. oh, go ahead, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, yes, they will. The issue here right now is actually timing. As Governor, as Reverend Boyer said, we need we need the governor to sign it now. Um, there's a link in the chat um, that you can call, um, urge him to sign it immediately because if they leave, if they um, if they um, leave the prisons, if they come home after October 13th, we're going to miss the window. So they might they'll come home. They might be on parole. They might be on probation. Uh, they might be on parole. They might um, be um, have their sentence completed. But it's too late to register and vote for November's election. So we have a small window right now. So they need to come home. We need this law passed so that they can come home and they hopefully have enough time to register. Um, it also um, once again, um, highlights the need for same day registration, including on election day. So we do not have three weeks of, of, of an arbitrary deadline. Um, lots of states, over 20 states in the country do not do that. You can register on election day and vote. We have a three week um, arbitrary deadline and this is what happens. Um, we have, um, there's a lot of people who um, end up um, disenfranchised because of it. Sure, thank you. And before I move on to next question, just want to highlight for those interested in supporting the New Jersey Reparations Task Force, you can go to 400yearsnj.org. Again, that's 400yearsnj.org to call on your legislators to pass and Governor Murphy to sign the New Jersey Reparations Task Force. Um, the next question I'll just kick to the whole panel. Uh, there's a college educator and administrator who's feeling a sense of hopelessness from some of her students after this past presidential election, I mean, presidential debate, excuse me. And so what would you tell young people specifically to give them hope in the power of their vote during this election season and why they should vote when they feel maybe a sense that it might not matter? And I'll kick that to anyone. So I'll take that one on. I mean, I would say both Cass and Ron are proof positive that the right to vote is precious and that it matters greatly. Um, it's not lost on me that in this election in 32 days, 83,000 people on probation and parole can now access the power of the vote. If this was a right denied to Hennel's point for a reason, going back to 1844. And so I think 
particularly for young people, situating young people in the voting rights struggle, right? In this country, democracy has always been a full contact sport, right? It's always been contested, particularly for Black people and other people of color. It's been char characterized by efforts to expand democracy, always followed by efforts to scale it back. And it's been young people who've always been central to the effort to expand democracy. And so to young people, to the, to the, the college students, especially to high school students who are eligible to vote, old enough to vote, I encourage this, look, this is a young person's moment. The millions of people who've taken to the street have been led by young people. Social movements have always been led by young people. We recently celebrated the life of John Lewis, who died at 80. The last place that John Lewis went publicly was to the Black, was Black Lives Matter Square just across from the White House in Washington, DC. And John Lewis becomes famous in his 20s for giving his body on a bridge uh, during a march that led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And within just one generation, the election of the first Black president. I mean, that's the way in which the vote matters. And in a democracy, that's the way that you get powerful, that you organize your voices around the collective agenda that culminates in a vote. And then the vote is about then being exercised and building an accountability once cast. And so for us, we're in a dual space. We've got to ensure that we exercise the right to vote. Here in New Jersey, there are a number of things on the ballot. Yes, vote and the federal election to be sure, but there, there are elections on the ballot all the way down to county commission. Every one of those matters greatly. There are questions on the ballot that you, you really ought to answer because those matter to your voice as well. But once we vote, after we vote, holding our elected officials accountable is as important as voting. And so the issues that Reverend Boyer lifted up, elected officials have to feel that you're watching them and you're holding them accountable. And if they don't do what you want them to do, don't vote for them or run against them. There are options that give us power in this democracy, but the way we're made weakest is when we think about democracy as a spectator sport and we watch it from the sidelines. So to Hennel's point, I say double down on democracy. That's when we're most powerful. Can I add one thing to that? I just wanted to say, um, because the um, educator mentioned that, you know, it was after the debate that people are discouraged. Um, what do you do about that? And uh, one thing, and everything Ryan said, exactly right. Uh, one thing that I don't think people recognize enough, um, we realize, is that, you know, there's a lot of ways that voter suppression is done. You know, we do it, you know, we do it by limiting who can vote right into uh, the constitution. We do it by laws that restrict um, access, voter ID laws in other states. Um, putting in laws to um, arbitrary deadlines for registration. There are laws, we do, uh, things we do. But another thing that happens, you voter suppression also works by getting people to distrust the system, by getting people to distrust democracy, to making people believe that your vote doesn't matter, that none of this matters. It serves their purpose. It serves their purpose because they don't want you to vote. It's better to have, for, for a lot of elected officials, it's better to have fewer people voting, that's fewer people they're accountable to. So actually buying into that, actually believing it, it, it serves their purpose. So uh, for our end, the only way to combat that, to actually battle and actually fight against voter suppression is to commit to democracy, is to double down on it. Use your voice, use your power, vote on things because voter suppression takes on a lot of forms. Um, there's a lot of ways people um, do things that discourage people, but also um, affect our representation. We have, a, um, uh, Ryan mentioned ballot questions. There are ballot questions. There's three of them on the ballot this year. Some, if you're ballot, they might be on the back. You should check that um, depending on the county. One of them is a question about redistricting. It sounds fine. It sounds like, oh, you know, it's because of COVID. We need to make sure everyone's counted. Let's do this. But in reality, what it is, it's a permanent change for, for an issue related to an issue that happened once, right? This pandemic that we, um, that's unprecedented, a permanent change to our, um, to our um, constitution that says that any time our data that we get from the census, which is why the census is so important, take it, the, uh, we get it, we will delay redistricting. 
we redistricting is the foundation of our representative democracy. It decides who, where you live and who your elected official, um, who's gonna be running for, um, for office, how you get to vote and who you get to vote with to decide your elected officials. And what, what's on the ballot, if passed, will hurt communities of color. It'll deny them fair representation for two years because we are more diverse now than we were 10 years ago when the existing map was drawn. And they're saying that, you know what, because of this delay, because of these issues, we're just gonna use the old map for two more years. Yeah, communities of color are gonna be hurt, but you know, that's fine. Um, and that we can't let them do that, right? Because that's also suppressive. It denies people representation. It denies people their fair share of, of their voice in the system. And we can't let them do that in any way. Thank you, Hedel. And so as we have the last few minutes are winding down, I want to turn it back to Ron and Cass just to say, you know, this is one of the most important presidential elections in our lifetime, many say. And so what would you both say, why is voting in this election so important to you? And what does it mean to you to have this right back um, to, to exercise this important fundamental right during the season? I'll turn it to maybe Cass first and then turn it to Ron to close us out. It's been a transformative uh, experience for me uh, to be able to know that I have a voice. Voting is my voice. Um, just yesterday, I registered about six young system impacted individuals who didn't think that they had the right to vote. And they were like, they, they felt like I felt when I was able to vote. And it was, it was impactful, it was vital and it's necessary. And young folks want to vote and they want change and their future. So just to give them these, this platform to be able to be a part of the change is what, what matters. So it's nothing like it to belong and to feel like you, you matter and you have a say to what happens in your life. Thank you, Cass. Um, Ron, do you want to close this out? Sure. The, the, the importance of this moment in time cannot be overstated. That's just, a, that's just a, the way the, the, it is in, in today's world. But what this, this means to me personally, because it is my first chance to, to go back to voting since, since my last time I was able to vote was 1985. And what it means to me is it means that I get once again to have my voice be, be part of the chorus of my community. It means that I get to be part of, of the say so in who is going to have the, the elected voice that, that is going to speak for this nation, for this state, and for my community. I get the voice my say in who is who. It is not so unrealistic to believe that whatever happens, right? I get to say my piece before it happens. Mm -hmm. I get to say it. whether my candidates win or my candidate loses, I get to say that this person is my voice. That's what I get to say. That is why it's so important. And I get to say, I want my children, I want my grandchildren to say this, to be able to say, wow, it's important to him. Let me try starting it when I'm younger and maybe I'll be connected to my society and I'll, it'll be important to me. I get to be a role model for the next generation. So yes, it's important to me personally, but it's important to me throughout. And, and I get to say it. And, and that is what I would uh, close out with. Thank you. And I couldn't think of a more powerful note to close out on, Ron. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you leave this conversation activated and inspired. And as you think of what you can do in your own community to ensure registration, restoration, and reparation, I encourage you to download the Institute's Action Agenda 10 Ways to Do Racial Justice Advocacy After You Say Black Lives Matter. I dropped it in the chat a little earlier and this important document outlines 10 ways you can do racial justice now in your own communities. With that, thank you all for joining us. Stay safe and hopeful and have a good night. Thank you so much.